Thank you, everybody, for joining this morning, this evening, from wherever you are in the world. Um, really thrilled to be joining us, joining Vera Mulyani, our fantastic speaker for today. Um, so before I hand it over to Vera, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping notes for today. Um, so as a reminder, we have a couple of activities going on alongside the Innovation Challenge. First of all is our Watermark Volunteer Activity where you can complete some fun activities and earn some points to earn great prizes, including donations to charities of your choice and also do good for your community. So check that out on Slack. We're also announcing that we have some incentives for you to engage on the platform. So we have our water masterclasses available. And now every time that you watch a water masterclass video, you can earn points towards a leaderboard and we encourage you all to be part of that leaderboard and whoever is earning the most points can win a gift card to um, the PayPal to have a little bit of an incentive to engage in our water masterclass. So uh, thank you again all for joining. Now I'm really thrilled to introduce our speaker, Ms. Vera Mulyani. And Ms. Mulyani has a fascinating career in architecture, which you should all ask her about to learn more about. But that career has led her to her current role as the founder and CEO of Mars City Design, which is a really fantastic mission-driven organization focused on bringing humanity to Mars. And in addition to that, Ms. Mulyani is a systems engineering instructor for Mars-focused system design at Loyola Marymount University. And you'll hear more about Ms. Mulyani's history in her talk, but I wanted to hand it over to you and also just to everybody watching, I encourage you to ask questions. Um, she's a great resource and has a lot of interesting insights. So looking forward to hearing your talk. Thanks, Vera. Thank you so much, Dali. Hello, everyone. Really happy to have you here today. My name is Vera Mulyani. I created both Mars City Design and the nonprofit Mars City Foundation back in 2015 with the vision to make a blueprint for thriving destinations on Mars that can solve some of the biggest issues on Earth. It's an ambitious challenge, so we're really grateful for our collaborations with innovative corporate partners. So thanks to Xylan, specifically Dali Delph and Chris for opening these possibilities. It's truly a dream comes true when we can find a synergy and create something valuable for the future and environment through educational activities like this. We are very fortunate also to have participated in some NASA programs to have allies like DASO Systems, SpaceX, NanoRacks, and some media partners like Space Channel and the Discovery Channel who have reached over 100 million people on this planet to recognize Mars City Design's efforts through consistent annual challenge program workshops and now building our prototype in California. Mars City Design has been influential to bridging architecture, human-centered design with space science. Our focus is Mars in both micro and macro urban design, obviously, for many reasons. One of them has a lot to do with water which is why I'm here today. Now, I'm not saying that I'm any expert of water science, nor am I a historian for water-related contacts on Mars, nor a geologist. But what I can offer is the combination of all the necessary ingredients of all of the above with the help of those experts. So we can envision, for example, what kind of innovation or design needed at which landing location so humans can start planning our next quest to step on Mars. I'm also adapting this presentation exclusively to your Xylem Global Student Challenge with the scenario where a series of unmanned missions have set up a base camp within Arcadia Planitia. Good choice, by the way. I'll tell you why. And you, as the exploration team of five people, arrive to further investigate the area and to develop an infrastructure plan to support a growing population. Assuming that your trip went well, what they didn't tell you if this was a sci-fi movie was that you were maybe eight in the crew before you ran out of water and your crew now is only five or that you were perhaps only four people since a nine month trip can offer many possibilities. I'm just messing up with your imagination here. 
Your quest is to provide water systems that will enable sustainable life for 100 scientists, engineers, and designers that will be arriving in the years to come. How, where, and when to allocate water resources throughout the self-sustaining community? So, I won't obviously tell you the answers to all these, but I can give you enough context for food of thoughts and imaginations through some design methods, the history and actuality of water on Mars that we know of. So here's the summary of my talk today. At Mars City Design, I like to suggest using a top-down solution method of design, where we want to focus on number one, the most important, our ideal destination. So that will determine what kind of activities we can do that is super fun and worth the lifetime experience. If exploration and science are, of course, no longer enough for long-term settlement. So what kind of world and culture we'd like to create? So the design solution will offer thriving destination instead of just surviving, which is the Mars City design mission. For example, I can imagine going to Mars to retire. So my ideal would be that retiring means reverse aging stay youthful and improve my health. So if there is an incredible spa resort where natural spring flows full of rejuvenating mineral like sulfur and colorful Martian algaes, then the retirement vacation can be my ideal destination. Another exciting ideal activity I'm thinking about that has to do with water is surfing or pedal boarding. What if we can all just pedal board to go from one place to another on Mars? So this is when all the scientists and engineers will scream, impossible! Then what we want to do is to ask them, why is it impossible? So we want to learn about the context of Mars that can support this vision and invite our screaming scientists to participate and understand that the new problems we need to solve can help solve existing urgent issues as well. Then secondly, we wanna learn and understand the overall context and exploration. Within that context, we wanna look at our sites, then we wanna list our needs as humans in such condition and new extreme environment. How do we live there? Within this site exploration, we want to look at the history, the condition. We also better check out the existing efforts that have been done so we don't repeat the same journey to save some time. If you know the filmmaker David Lynch, he said once, learn from others' mistakes instead of just learning from our own mistakes. So from this site study, we will be able to know, for example, where is the best landing sites as the first steps. Then within the human needs, we want to look at, of course, our focus here, the water. What existing effort is operating and what is the cost effective study looking like. And from here, we will know what kind of technology needed to be integrated into our design or innovation. Only then, third step, we can now see possibilities and start planning how to create an ideal destination on Mars, water-related, which won't repeat the same mistakes as what have been done, and learn from our site homework how we can have a water recycling surfing center for Vera's retirement on Mars. That's just a silly example, but that's basically all the steps that we have been doing at Mars City Design so far. So now let's explore the context. Let's see the history and the condition, the existing efforts that NASA and its international and commercial partners have been doing for the past decades. We all may know that water on the surface of Mars have been detected somehow since even the year of 1600s from Galileo time. 
when he observed Mars with a primitive telescope. Unfortunately, he ended his life tragically due to this too early science discovery that contradicted other previous ideology in the religious society at the time. So here is Johannes Kepler triangulated the position of Mars by using the observations of Mars when it returned to the same position in its orbit. Fast forward to 1877, there is an Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli who observed Mars with a newly powerful refractor telescope installed in Milan. He saw deep trenches meandering across the planet's surface which he called Canali. Canali. But the specific advances and odd misunderstandings at the time convinced many that Mars was full of canals built by an advanced civilization. What's interesting is when we look at the recent remarkable discovery from past few years, this is what NASA illustrated to interpret the surface of water on Mars coming from all the data from the past but also the recent years by high resolution imaging science experiment high rise we owe so much from their effort because they have been uh, bringing a lot of photograph of the planet that aim to indicate the presence of liquid water it's a camera aboard of NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we believe that, of course, where there is water, there is life. So here is the successive uh, comprehension of how water disappeared on Mars from 4 billion years ago to how it is today. Let's take a look at the successive efforts that NASA and its commercial and international partners have been doing to keep continuing the Mars discovery effort. The Mariner 9 is a spacecraft that beat the Soviet Mars 2 and became the first spacecraft to orbit another planet at the time. This was an incredible mosaic of Mariner 9 images of Mars photograph by NASA Science Photo Library. Mariner 9 mapped 85% of the Martian surface, it collected valuable information about the Martian surface and atmosphere. It took more than 7,000 images, it was huge at the time, revealing that the planet had both ancient crater terrain and more modern tectonized and eroded areas. Some of the most significant were the first detailed views of the solar system's largest volcano, which is Olympus Mons. Here's the striking image of Olympus Mons. It's a giant volcano 22 kilometer high and 600 kilometer wide. It's about the size of the state of Arizona. So one reason volcanoes are important is that they can contribute to the development and evolution of a rocky planet's atmosphere. Mariner 9 also took the first pictures of Phobos and Deimos, which is the Martian moons. Another significant effort is the picture of Valles Marineris, a canyon system that dwarfs the Grand Canyon. Valles Marineris is where Mars City Design has been using as a location to experiment our theory on building a macro settlement. Out of the thousands of pictures that Mariner 9 has produced, this is Warrego Valles. This image suggests that rain or snow was necessary to form this kind of branched network of channels. Then we go to the Viking program. Somehow this water hunting mission continued. The Viking program inherited all the knowledge from Mariner 9. Uh, Viking 1 and 2 is actually both an orbiter and a lander. So the Viking lander becomes the first spacecraft to successfully land on Mars. 
It depicted many locations with geological evidence of liquid lava flows and ancient water presence at its operational site. One of them is this Bahram Valis. Bahram Valis is located between Christ Planitia and Eris Valis. This is an ongoing study of the site that NASA believes is full of uh, ancient water activities that we want to learn more about. They even set up this 3D animation so that we can virtually visit the site. Viking 1 lander performed the first Martian soil sample using its robotic arm and a special biological laboratory. While it found no traces of life, Viking 1 did help better characterize Mars as a cold planet with volcanic soil, a thin, dry carbon dioxide atmosphere, and striking evidence for ancient riverbeds and vast flooding. So that was a huge water-related discovery. Now moving to 1996 Mars Global Surveyor Mission, we see here an image of an inverted streams near Juvente Chasma. Juvente was named by Schiaparelli after Juvente Fonts, which means the Fountain of Youth. This is located between North Valles Marineris and Lone Planum. Another location that is closer to Ecuador, which is apparently very much recommended for human landing sites is an enormous box canyon, distance of 250 kilometer by 100 kilometer, which opens to the north and forms the outflow channel Maya Valles. So the reality about water on Mars is really not like how it looks like on the surface. NASA then started to have fancier instruments for both the lander and orbiter like temperature x-ray, I would call it. They have thermal emission imaging systems, so it's called THEMIS, a camera on Mars Odyssey mission. We've seen this image before. The Mars ocean hypothesis states that nearly a third of the surface of Mars was covered by an ocean of liquid water early in the planet's geologic history. So this is an artist's impression of what ancient Mars may have looked like based on geological data that we have accumulated so far. To find ice that astronauts could easily dig up, the study's authors relied on two heat-sensitive instruments, so the THEMIS on the Mars Odyssey and the MRO's Mars Climate Sounder. So why do we use heat-sensitive instruments when looking for ice? So apparently buried water ice changes the temperature of the Martian surface. Then they were able to create the ice deposits mapping. So this Odyssey mission was to study rather the regions near the poles where they found evidence of Martian water ice locked away underground throughout the planet's mid-latitudes. It scrapped up ice, which is the key factors whether the water ever became available as a liquid or whether organic compounds are present that could provide chemical building blocks and energy for life. How they knew it was water ice and not carbon dioxide is that after three days, the ice disappeared. So they created an experiment they were digging in and exposed a bright material but then after three days, it vaporized. So as expected, all these data suggested a trove of water ice throughout the Martian poles and mid-latitudes. But the map reveals particularly shallow deposits that future mission planners may want to study further. Now the current effort is going a lot on a subsurface. All these combinations of experiments Discoveries, exploration, knowledge, or where the water is on Mars actually help us to have this map, which was created in December 2019, right when COVID started. 
This, for example, was created by combining data from multiple NASA orbiters. So we see the darker the color, it means the deeper the water is. So where you see the light colors here, like blue to green colors, represent less than one foot, which is 30 centimeters below the surface. And the darker the colors are over two feet, 60 centimeter deep. And so the black zones on the map represent areas where a landing spacecraft would sink into the fine dust. Now the outline box up there represents the ideal region to send astronauts for them to be able to dig up water ice. And of course, we arrived where last year NASA launched Perseverance and it arrived in February this year. I'm sure you're all so excited just like I was. These images are just recollections of data that they map together and make it accessible for virtual experience. So you guys could check it out at the NASA website on a Perseverance mission and you can actually navigate on their three-dimensional virtual map. This is the illustration to show how much water it was at the Jezero crater which means lake. Now all these landing sites that NASA did, since it was all robotic missions and sending instruments to really learn about the planet and learn about its geology. So it's all scientific missions. Now completely different from human mission, we better check out what would human needs when we are away from Earth related to water. Now your site is in Arcadia Planitia, but apparently you're free to choose other sites. So just about Arcadia Planitia very quickly, recently thick flow features including common ice related features found across the mid-latitude of Mars Many scientists from around the world who have been studying the North Pole, Alaska, are joining this team to identify and map glacial-related features in the lower mid-latitude of Arcadia Planitia based on morphology, albedo, thermal infrared reflectance, thermal inertia, and subsurface radar reflections. The sinuous features appear to be channelized ice that once flowed but currently reside in a flat-lying region. What makes Arcadia Planitia a potentially favorable site for future missions due to the high potential for in-situ resource utilization is this abundant evidence of widespread near-surface ice in a flat-lying lower mid-latitude region of Mars. So the newest discovery that scientists are looking at is that water on Mars may have not all disappeared, but 30 to 90% of the water are actually living inside the crust, not all evaporated. So for the human landing site, we like this area because it's easier water access now, once we send humans to Mars, it's completely another level of technology, design, planning, and operation. There is suddenly a huge amount of math and equation in the water economy that we think about exporting it from Earth versus making it on site. They call it ISRU, in situ resource utilization. So when humans are going to Mars, on the way to Mars, we need water. Arriving on Mars, we need water. So let's say now six to nine months missions with four people in the crew. What are we looking at? Just calculate how much water we need per day, multiply five and multiply the amount of flight duration to get to Mars. And perhaps the first three to six months of water supply. When you calculate it, it becomes excessively expensive to carry our own water from Earth. To reduce the amount of water transported from the ground as much as possible, NASA has been exploring these instruments that they put in the International Space Station to recycle water uh, collected from the astronauts' urine 
and dehumidification of the cabin air into drinking water. First, of course, everybody says, ew. But once you understand the system, it actually makes a lot of sense. The instrument that they have that have been operating all this time, the International Space Station is called Environmental Control and Life Support System, ECLSS. ECLSS has enabled more crew members to live aboard the station for longer expeditions with fewer resource shipments. So the key components of the regenerative ECLSS are the water recovery system and the air revitalization system. The water recovery system provides clean water for astronauts by recycling urine, cabin humidity condensate from crew sweat, respiration, and hygiene, and water recovered from air revitalization system. The urine processor assembly part of the water recovery system was designed for 85% water recovery from crew urine and has been improved over the last year to now recover 87% because of analysis that showed there was still a margin against calcium sulfate precipitation. To establish a new generation water recovery system that is smaller in size, consumes less power, has a higher recovery rate, and is easier to maintain than the water recycle system currently in use on the ISS, there are several improvement demo that commercial and international space industry is working on. This one is called Brian Processor Assembly BPA. The BPA's dual membrane bladder works to recover additional water from urine brine. It will be tied into the system and allow more water to be recovered from crew urine. This new piece of technology will help scientists to build better systems that can be used for future Moon and Mars missions and habitats. Because of the BPA, the overall water recovery increases about 93.5%. Now, another international partner of NASA is JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. It also prepares a scale model of water recovery system for technology demonstration on the Japanese experiment module Kibo. Kibo features low power consumption, small size, and high efficiency. It is considered advantageously applicable to future manned space exploration as well as to Earth application, which is on the drought areas, disaster areas where water resources are limited on the ground. So the gem water recovery system offers a few functions from recycles urine and artificially synthetic urine into drink quality water through this uh, three major treatment process. So it has number one, the ion exchange. It's using exchanged resin, magnesium, and calcium contained in urine to remove it. So once the magnesium and calcium are removed, it will be able to go to the second stage. A high temperature and high pressure to make it possible to completely decompose even uneven, hard to decompose organic matter. So then once any ions left over from the previous process are removed, then the water is suitable for drinking. Now that we know from our context exploration both the sites, which is the best landing sites, and our need, the technology needed, we can take a look at what Mars City Design have been doing as an ideal destination project. The Willow Center is an example of a winning design from Mars City Design Challenge 2018, designed by an engineer and architect team from Arup. After a few development during the workshop, we were able to find one of the most critical issues that we need to solve before we send human to Mars is that, as you could see on these pictures, every single return to Earth from the space station, there are always a team of people who will welcome them pull them out physically from the capsule because after some zero gravity in space, 
the body has a hard time to readapt immediately with our gravity. So there's always people to assist our arrival. Now, the first crews to get to Mars, who will welcome them? Who will pull them out of the capsules? Assuming that, of course, you have overcome all the odds. So this team have the idea of building a welcoming and recovery center for the astronauts who arrive on Mars using water as the first physical landing place. Another example would be this winning design of Mars City Challenge 2018 for the Macro Urban Design category by Jack Oliva Rendler. It's an example of another illustration closer to sci-fi at the first glance, but we developed together the concept to be a solution for settling in a lower canyon area of Valles Marineris, protected from the radiation. Also because it's closer to the equator, there may be more atmosphere to help slow down the MAV crew module descent landing. And so the spacecraft is able to extend structures while providing on-surface transportation systems. That's two examples of architectural ideal destination that uses the top-down design method of Mars City. Additionally, we just published a book called The Martian Dispatches. If you're really interested in imagining new ideal destinations, you should definitely check this out. We have it on our website, marscitydesign.com shop. What you can expect from the Martian Dispatches is that you can listen to the voices of the Martians from the future that will tell us the stories of how their life is, how their new habits, lifestyles, cultures, and all the activities that can inspire all of us today to build the path towards successful human missions to Mars. We got to start somewhere, right? So now that we have laid off all the context understanding and possibilities, we're able to make plannings. Here is another study that we're working on at the moment, understanding the payload capacity to get to Mars and what kind of form uh, format that we need to design to fit. Aiming that this image of a city occupying Valles Marineris will not just be an illustration, but something inspiring for us to create the real mission so I guess that's about it. Uh, if anyone have any questions, given the amount of perchlorates on Mars, what might be risk of water or other environmental contamination? That's a very good question. And again, I am a believer of NASA information. <laughs> so um, with perchlorates, what they have studied is that the amount of perchlorates compared to the amount of water filtering system uh, that could be cultivated is not that important. And even for uh, the crew member, they have apparently some uh, solutions like medication that will help them to completely uh, eliminate any poisoning of the perchlorates. And uh, yeah, you can actually know more about that on a NASA podcast. So if you want to listen to a uh, NASA podcast, uh, it's called Houston, we have a podcast. And uh, there is a lot of uh, talks in there where you can learn about uh, the risk of uh, water on Mars and the missions uh, to go to Mars. And actually the, the most recent one is called Returning from Mars. And you have a lot of information there with current status of the NASA mission to Mars. Ideally, how far would you want your city to be from the water source given the amount of mining and surface processing needed? So this is a very interesting question uh, for 
what's interesting right now is that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the trip to Mars has been always robotic mission, and it's all to fulfill the science uh, knowledge. And the human mission will be completely different, like because the spacecraft will be different. They will design more comfortably uh, to land. And also the landing site would not just depend on safety, uh, it would depend on uh, the activities that we will, we will be creating. So right now they all are talking about the North Pole uh, where ice are actually visible on the surface. So uh, they also talk about a little bit on the south of the pole where it's the best landing site so that we could return from Mars to Earth without having to uh, put so much effort to um, launch. So uh, it's interesting because a lot of people are talking about uh, landing on Mars, but somehow the systems engineering to go to Mars always integrate the whole thing. Like you can't just talk about the landing system. You have to talk about uh, how you will, you know, create the settlement, for example, but also if we want to go back to earth, like, you know, we should consider that because at the moment the launch pad will be the landing pad. So it's not just about where to mine the water. I think it's mostly safety and uh, activities that they want to choose. And then uh, of course, uh, the most uh, less, the least effort that we should do to get water. On earth, we're so used to taking water for granted in our day-to-day -day life. On Mars, what would it be like to turn on the tap? Could you take whatever water you wanted or would it be rationed? So as I mentioned, I think uh, the interest of that method of design of top-down method that I demonstrated is that we kind of understand, uh, you know, the different steps like there would be water we need to carry for the crew to uh, survive six to nine months of the travel. But we should, before going, think about what kind of in-situ resource utilization we can operate, uh, knowing that we have the right tools and uh, the redundancy storage, water storage that we have in case the mission is not successful, in case the a uh, tool that we carry to mine water is probably uh, lacking some oil or something, <laughs> but it, it actually will help to understand the overall uh, project. So I think the first step, you can't just expect, you know, we can use water like we do on earth. Even on Earth, we shouldn't actually use water like we do today. Uh, if we can all apply the water recycling solution that International Space Station is doing, we may be able to uh, somehow save our clean water and uh, provide better solution for the environment. So. I think uh, that's it for the questions. I'd like you to actually uh, check out our website and say hello. And we're here to discuss more in the future. If you have any, any questions, if you have any ideas uh, for Mars, uh, let me know. That's fantastic. Thank you, Vera, for Thank sharing you, all the information. Oh, I think I have an echo stopping that. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, and I had I had one other question. Um, you know, I was just wondering since you've been in this Mars world for such a long time, and of the remaining unanswered questions that we have about um, dealing with water on Mars, what do you think is the most 
exciting unanswered question that there's still a lot of room for creativity to figure out new solutions. Yeah, that's a very deep question. Um, Getting into your philosophical side. I think what is exciting, if if actually if you read our book, uh, The Martian Dispatches, we somehow demonstrate there uh, the future that we envision that, you know, uh, people on Mars, the third generation who would be born on Mars would actually not um, experience uh, the different countries separated from each other. They would actually speak universal language. They would mix all kinds of languages to speak to each other. And that to say uh, that it's definitely an ongoing uh, journey and we are just starting, even if, as you saw my timeline about instruments being sent to Mars since uh, the uh, 1971 and since 1600 uh, of Galileo time, we just, Started were so microscopic compared to the universal timeline, right? Like four billion years ago, Mars had contained water, but what happened uh, from now to the next three generations? You know, when they are going to Mars, and um, we have to understand, like. It's, it doesn't take only an engineer, uh, only a team of engineers to accomplish that if we want to send humans. It involves everyone. It involves every career to uh, be in unity and um, discuss and exchange knowledge, efforts, and time and creativity mostly to really make a mission happen. So I think uh, from this challenge that you guys are creating, the most beautiful thing that we could see is that uh, different multidisciplinary uh, teams would unite and create a phenomena that uh, is the beginning of invention or innovation. But yeah, the key, the key um, aspects here is to really understand context and uh, the the list that I've mentioned, you know, about existing efforts, that's so important to know uh, because we don't want to have to repeat everything. It takes many generations to accomplish where we're at right now. And uh, it takes like a lot of years to just understand uh, where they're at. So. Yeah, we don't start from scratch, but keep continuing the path. So yeah, anything, anything that is about water is so important, of course. So they are definitely on the right path. Oh, that's a call to action if I've ever heard one. It's definitely <laughs> a great way to bring together everybody. Yeah. With that, I think we can close out this webinar. And thank you all again. And. Enjoy the rest of your day, evening. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, everyone, I hope to stay in touch with you and good luck for the design.